This story starts with the introduction of Necropia, the realm of the dead, a place completely devoid of a single trace of life. In this desolate world stands a grand castle, the only one in Necropia. This castle is packed with things that are beyond imagination, which includes endless golden pillars, stunning ornaments, and murals. The sprawling marble halls are lined with intricately crafted, glorious sculptures. But the ruler of this place, and at the heart of it all, is the Death King Karnak. Karnak is the supreme ruler of Necropia, having mastered and controlled death itself. But after centuries, he realized that humans weren't meant to wield such power. His huge mistake in messing with death has led to his own regret, as he now finds himself as one of the undead. Before we get deeper into the story, here's the lowdown on how Karnak ended up as an undead. Back in his human days, Karnak was the bastard child of a fallen noble family. He lost his mother when he was young and was constantly pressured by other nobles. Over time, he grew to trust only himself, and the desire for power got stuck in his head. That's when he stumbled upon a forbidden codex about necromancy and veered off the path of being human. Not long after, Karnak drove every human and kingdom to death. The fourth martial king and the three grand mages tried to resist, but he turned them into his own subjects. Even the guardians of the world tried to stop him, but when he turned the last remaining guardian, Dragon Emperor Grateria, into his subject, it was game over for everyone. Karnak then transformed his own flesh into the ultimate ascendant of Astra Schnapf, and he finally became the most powerful undead and the strongest death king to ever exist. At the time, Karnak thought he'd hit the peak of his life. With absolute power, he believed he'd be able to savor all the pleasures life had to offer, but he was dead wrong. Now 70 years later, he's stuck in a fleshless body with rattling bones. He's not sure how much longer he can endure this pathetic existence, unable to feel or desire any human pleasures. He misses the warm sunshine, the gentle breeze, the warmth of another human, and even the terrible pain that used to dig into his flesh. Anything would be better than this dry, empty life. But it seems he has one last hope of turning back into a human. If he succeeds, his wish might finally be fulfilled. Just then, someone strolls into his castle. With each step, the rattling noise of their armor fills the air. The armored figure calls out to the ruler of life and death, respectfully greeting King Death Karnak. This knight in armor is Baros, the head commander of the Legions of Death. At that moment, the king tells Baros that the preparations are ready, and he's feeling really positive about this. Hearing this, Baros gets all cute and emotional, because he's been searching for a way to recover the pleasures of the flesh alongside Karnak. But they both know that pleasures work by fulfilling what one lacks, and for someone like Karnak and Baros, who have ascended to the ultimate level, no ordinary method could satisfy those needs. However, because they are the ultimate ascended, there's a chance they could find a way to recover their pleasures. They can't enjoy human pleasures because they aren't human anymore, but there might be a way to turn back time to when they were. Karnak then says they'll probably have to go back to the moment he first gained the mana of darkness. Baros is still worried though, and reminds his king that if they fail, their existence might disappear. But Karnak brushes it off, saying that he has no interest in staying stuck as a pile of bones, and further makes it clear that Baros can stay behind if he wants, but he would rather take the risk. While blushing, the armored knight quickly responds that he would never dare to leave his master's side. With that in mind, they both start the mojo. Purple light begins to flash, and after a while, a man's voice can be heard telling his friend to wake up. It looks like whatever mojo they did was a success. Barros has transformed into a blonde dude, while Karnak is on the ground. As Karnak starts to stand up, he's surprised to see Barros in his new look. The blondie then also comments on how Karnak's face has returned to its old, scrawny, pompous appearance. Karnak feels annoyed, and reminds him that he still has no sense of respect. Anyway, they both get up and start looking around. If they've traveled back to the right time, the Forbidden Codex on Necromancy should be nearby. And just as expected, Karnak spots it sitting on a desk. He stares at the Codex, reflecting on how he once walked the path of Necromancy using knowledge from this very book. Deciding to try out his old powers, he flicks his finger, and a purple fire surrounds the book. Within a few seconds, the book has been turned into nothing but ashes. Barros asks if it's really a good idea to just burn the book like that. But Karnak casually replies that he's already learned everything from it, so it's better if this thing doesn't exist in the world anymore. The knight can't help but admire his king for how he's already planned everything out so carefully. He even comments that Karnak looks more handsome than usual. Suddenly, both of their bellies start to grumble. But instead of feeling sad or dejected, they're absolutely amazed upon hearing this unsettling noise in their belly, because they haven't craved food in ages. They happily and excitedly venture out to grab some grub. A while later, the entire town is echoing with their screams of delight. It's been so long since these two idiots have had a piece of bread, 
and even this dry bread tastes so amazing that they're calling it nothing short of a masterpiece. Barros is practically tearing up with every bite, barely able to contain the rush of happiness flooding his brain. He's willing to die for food like this. Karnak's reaction is just as intense. Tears are streaming down his face like a waterfall. He reminds Barros, through his own tearful sobs, that they've just been revived. So let's not talk about dying. Barros points out that gambling their lives for this much deliciousness was absolutely worth it. The bread tastes so amazing that it's literally blocking his vision with tears. Karnak agrees but warns Barros to keep an eye on how much he eats. After all, money doesn't just fall from the sky. As they're enjoying their bread, their eyes wander to the table next to them. Delicious smells waft their way, which completely boggles their minds. I mean, who wouldn't lose their mind seeing a whole roasted chicken, perfectly golden and mouth-watering? As much as they want to devour it, there's no way they can afford it. It's going to cost a fortune, and Karnak is from a fallen noble family. The desire to eat that chicken is so intense that this idiot is even considering killing these bastards, while Barros is freaking out in the background, warning his friend that they're going to get beaten up with their current strength. Barros decides to check his pouch to see how much money they have since they need to pay for the bread too. But when he looks inside, despair washes over his face. He quickly calls out to Karnak, saying they have a little problem. Karnak asks what's wrong, and Barros reveals that their time travel had some unexpected effects on other things too. Karnak also looks into his pouch and finds it strange. There's no way they should have this much money, and most of it is in silver coins. He wonders where things began to go wrong. You see, in his past life, his family's financial situation was dire. His grandfather, Baron Greyfield, had started numerous businesses using the territory as collateral, but they all failed, leaving only debts behind for his father, Baron Kraput. Unfortunately, his father couldn't handle the mounting debts, and his original wife and two sons were no help at all. Karnak, the bastard child born into the fallen family, received all of the family's scorn and persecution, barely managing to survive each day. At least, that's how it played out in his past life, so he has no clue where all this money could have come from. He is genuinely worried about this. It's not something to take lightly, and he wonders if the regression spell might have gone wrong. But Barros admits he's not sure either. Karnak is not sure if they have actually time-traveled into the past, or they have just hopped into an entirely different timeline. But he pushes those worries aside when Barros reminds him that they can finally enjoy that delicious chicken. After all, their concerns won't just disappear if they don't use the money. Karnak quickly gives Barros the green light to place an order. Barros decides to get one chicken, but Karnak insists they should each have their own. So they end up ordering two whole chickens for themselves. As dusk settles, Barros's belly is stuffed to the brim, his shirt barely containing the bulge as his stomach tries to escape. His master is also feeling totally satisfied, and he is sure they should be able to pass out and sleep once they get back. Barros then grumbles about having to see their old family again. He's genuinely pissed off, as he hated them with every fiber of his being. Karnak reassures Barros that they'll be fine as long as they play their cards right and flatter the old family, but he admits their main concern is how everything has changed. Even the horses are different compared to what they had in their previous life. Not to mention the stable manager who seemed to be overly friendly and treating them like royalty. It's odd that a fallen family would have such a high-quality horse. Moreover, the citizens they bumped into earlier were acting completely out of character. Those who once scorned them and called them scoundrels were now thrilled to see them and even teared up with joy. Karnak agrees, saying there's definitely something strange going on. He just can't shake off the weirdness of it all. Barros tells him that they'll figure it out once they return home, and it looks like they have almost made it to the place. Karnak comments on how he hasn't seen the place in a while and is feeling strangely nostalgic about it. Barros, on the other hand, is just plain annoyed, because he doesn't have a single good memory of this place. You see, Barros was also an orphan and didn't live a comfortable life. His parents were absolute scumbags. Before they disappeared in the middle of the night, Barros was the one who found himself alone and dying. A surprising twist came when Karnak's father took him in, despite the family's disdain for illegitimate children. As a result, Barros ended up with an attendant position, which, despite the circumstances, gave him some much-needed stability in his life. Suddenly, Barros points in a certain direction and asks Karnak if that's the Jestar residence. Once Karnak looks in the direction Barros pointed, he quickly confirms it, saying this is the place they used to live in. The mansion behind the walls is massive, and Barros can't help but comment that they might have stumbled upon the wrong place. But Karnak quickly points out that this is definitely the place from his memories. He sees the tall brick wall, the two-story building with a terrace, and the extensive garden surrounding it. It all looks familiar, but it seems surprisingly lavish, and he has no clue from where they got all this money to spend. When they reach the door, the gatekeeper perks up and greets Karnak promptly. 
Not only are they welcomed, but the staff bows their heads in respect, leaving both of them astounded. Inside the mansion, the butler, who goes by the name Fapel Played, starts serving them tea and explains that it's been almost half a year since Karnak became the head of the family. This shocks Karnak, while the butler then asks if Karnak has achieved the goal he was aiming for. Of course, Karnak has no clue what goal the butler is talking about. Seeing Karnak's cluelessness, the butler asks if he's forgotten the reason he went on his journey. Karnak pretends to remember and says he sort of found his goal. The butler perks up at this and mentions that the late lord and Isabella would have been glad to hear this. As soon as Karnak and Baros hear the word late, Karnak quickly realizes that his father is dead, and it seems his stepmother must have died with him. The butler then points out that after Tessiel and Ferelth passed away as well, times were grim, but he's glad to see Karnak around handling everything. This explains why Karnak became the lord in the first place, but he still has no clue why his entire family died. The goal of his journey is obvious to him, and he's sure he must have been practicing necromancy while no one was watching. Barros leans in closer and reminds Karnak that there's no way he could have revealed the true goal of their journey. Karnak agrees, saying that's why he must have spouted some nonsense about going on a journey, though he is not sure why he would need necromancy in a situation like this. The butler notices their concern and asks why they're worrying so much. Barros quickly explains that the young master is exhausted from the long journey and suggests continuing the conversation tomorrow. The butler panics a bit and apologizes, saying he completely failed to consider that, and quickly escorts Karnak to his room for some well-deserved rest. Once inside, Karnak and Barros give each other a high five for cleverly getting into the room. Blondie then points out that, although they've managed to avoid trouble for now, they're still in the dark about what to do next. Everything is so new that he has no idea what's going on. Karnak then says he has a method for times like this and asks his friend if he's ready. He tells Barros they need to hurry because they have to make their move while everyone is asleep. As midnight strikes, we see the old butler sleeping soundly in his room. That's when Karnak and Barros sneak in. Blondie hands over his friend a bowl of herbs, and they decide to continue the mind inspection now. Karnak pours a purple substance into the bowl, and the medicine quickly starts to seep into the butler's brain through his nose. As soon as Karnak calls the butler to wake up, the old man's body starts to stir, and he quickly responds to his master. Karnak begins by asking him to explain the whole process of how the gestured finances improved and how he became the head of the household. The old man starts narrating that four years ago, while the second Yukon master was training, he happened to come across a large-scale copper mine. Karnak's eyebrows raise at this. To him, it sounds like a bunch of bullcrap because, as far as he knows, the mines were just an excuse used to hide dirty money. Even Barros nods in agreement, saying it's actually quite rare to stumble upon a mine like that. Karnak then asks why everyone in the family died within just four years if that's the case. The old man explains that the whole mess started with the location of the copper mine because it was in a neutral zone between the Jestard and Devontor families. Both sides claimed it was theirs, which kicked off a war. The Devontors, who were known for their top-notch military training, had no trouble taking down Baron Craput. Sir Randolph from the Devontor family easily defeated him and also killed young Master Tessel and the oldest son. The household's best knight, second young Master Ferelth, lost both his legs to Sir Randolph and ended up taking his own life. The Baroness, heartbroken by all the losses, didn't last long after that. So, young Master Karnak was picked to take over, even though he was just a kid. The families agreed to a ceasefire until he was old enough to take charge. But everyone was still worried about the copper mine and what would happen with the war compensation. That's when young Master Karnak came up with a plan, and he challenged Viscount Devontor to a trial duel, all in the name of Allium, the goddess of moon and justice. When the two idiots hear this, their jaws practically drop. You see, trial duels are held under the Allium Order's mandates, where you can even substitute a warrior in your place. The duel happens under the watchful eyes of an Allium priest, and the victor is decided only when one side dies. Barros leans in and tells his friend that it looks like he's really dug his own grave. Our boy just face palms in frustration, admitting that this wasn't exactly his idea. He figures that's why everyone is treating him so nicely, because he's probably going to lose this fight. But it kind of makes sense why his past self would agree to duel, because he knows that he can't win the war, and Devontor couldn't refuse the duel without damaging their reputation. By now, the only way to get out of this mess is to win the duel and secure the copper mine, and this is the only way to save them from starving. Barros points out, though, that with Karnak's current skills, he's pretty much a goner. Karnak, however, is determined to win this fight at all costs, and declares that this is exactly why he needs to train as hard as possible. He asks the old man when the duel is scheduled, and the butler informs him it's about a month away. Of course, both of them look utterly clueless and hopeless, because the duel is just around the corner with barely any time left to practice. 
Later, the table is piled high with mouth-watering food. Our guy reminds his friend that he's arranged all of this for his friend, because he's always working so hard and deserves a treat. But Barros questions if this is really the best time to relax, with the duel so close. Karnak just shrugs it off and cheerfully asks Barros if he could attend the duel instead. Of course, Barros's chewing comes to a halt as he realizes that the fancy food was just a bit of bribery. He quickly apologizes, admitting he's not exactly thrilled about the prospect of dying. Karnak reminds him that he's taken down three of the four martial kings single-handedly, so why he is feeling afraid of a simple duel. Barros explains in response that this was all thanks to the necromancy magic, and you can't just rely on experience to gain martial prowess. He gives an analogy, saying it's pointless to learn advanced swordsmanship if you don't have the arms to wield a sword. He admits he might have pulled it off with six months of training, but a month just isn't enough. Once he hears this, our guy quickly snatches the food away from Barros and tells him not to touch any more of it. Barros then asks why he didn't choose someone from the Knight Order. Our guy reminds him that if anyone from the Order had been strong enough, they wouldn't be having this conversation. Fired up, he declares that he's ready to use necromancy if that's what it takes to win the battle. But then Karnak remembers there's a hitch in this plan, necromancy is banned. He recalls that back in the day, when they were on the run, they had to eliminate a household stealthily using necromancy. The priest of Allium accused him of being the necromancer, and it was clear the priests were certain it was the work of dark magic. So once he was surrounded by enemies, he had to unleash his necromancy powers to escape. While he was running, he asked his junior how those people knew he used necromancy, even though the necromancy codex clearly said no one can detect this magic. That's when Barros explains that it's only civilian mages and knights who wouldn't be able to detect it, and someone like priests are an exception. Our guy lets out a sigh and laments how their plan is now a total flop. They can't use necromancy in the presence of the priests during the duel. Just then, Barros comes up with a brilliant idea. Why not just grab some money and run away? But Karnak dismisses this, saying it would be a waste of an opportunity. All the family members he despised are dead, and the people who disliked him once now like him very much. Suddenly, as Barros is heading down with the food, his senior stops him and tells him to sit back down because another shady plan has popped into his head. He admits it might be somewhat dangerous. But before we can hear more about this new plan, the scene transitions to the northern fort of Deventor. Soldiers are in the thick of combat, and when the senior officer orders a break, everyone collapses from exhaustion. The only one still standing in the field is Randolph, Deventor's strongest knight. A scrawny figure, known as Sir Bright, approaches him and asks how preparations for the trial duel are going. Randolph explains to Sir Bright that he doesn't need to prepare much for someone as unskilled as their opponent. Sir Bright agrees but advises him not to let his guard down, but the knight laughs it off once again and finds it ridiculous that he has to waste his time on a spoiled young master who knows nothing about the real world. But still, Sir Bright is concerned. Even though he's confident that Sir Randolph would never lose, he suspects the Karnak must have some kind of plan if he requested this duel. Suddenly they hear a commotion nearby. Sir Bright turns to see a merchant selling goods at the front of the yard, and he's annoyed by the constant presence of these outsiders peddling their wares. And of course, this merchant is none other than our boy, rocking a fake mustache while keeping a close eye on enemy activity. After watching Randolph fight, he realizes that while Randolph might be particularly powerful in combat, his opponent actually has a chance of winning in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Randolph is the simple, foolish type who relies on typical heavy sword techniques and hasn't even learned battle aura yet. It's easy to predict the movements of opponents like Randolph, which is a good thing for our boy. However, he's still certain that he needs more than a month to compete with this guy effectively. As he sits there, a woman calls out to him, asking why he's watching her brother Randolph so closely, like a total creep. Our boy quickly stands up and asks if she's really Randolph's little sister. She confirms she is, and asks if he has any business with Randolph. He explains that he's been captivated by the prowess of the North's strongest knight. To divert her attention, he points to his stall, showcasing a variety of colorful handkerchiefs and other stuff. Predictably, being the woman she is, she falls for the bait and expresses interest in one of the handkerchiefs. Our boy is pleased to see that he's managed to distract her just as he intended. The next scene transitions to the Jestar Estate's personal drill hall, where Barros is once again present. He explains that he's returned and asks our boy if his stamina training is going well. But, well, things aren't going as well as they hoped. Our guy is sprawled out on the ground, looking like his soul has already left his body. Blondie frantically shakes his master, telling him to wake up, and our boy groans, telling him to stop shaking him, or he might throw up all the delicious food he just ate. Blondie then asks if he ran the 50 laps around the drill hall like he was told. Karnak explains that he just finished and collapsed because he can't run anymore. Blondie remarks that his stamina is seriously lacking and that he's got a long way to go. Karnak then asks if there's even a point to all this training. 
to which Blondie replies that he can't do much with his current scrawny body, so he's got to keep grinding to at least build some muscle. But Karnak just can't endure this torture any longer, and pleads with his friend to let him rest for a moment. Blondie 